church. So a couple of quick announcements. Wednesday, there are no evening activities at all. Nothing. Oh, I'm being told that y'all need to sit down. I forget that. Thank you, Miss Jenny. I forget that. Y'all have to understand. So backstory, this is not part of the announcements. The first church I served in was a uh, Vietnamese church. And it seemed like it was one song and stand up and then sit down. And then one song and stand up and sit down. And so it was like calisthenics every morning. So I'd rather just stand the whole time instead of the up down. And I have a bad knee. So this whole bendy bend doesn't work for me. But I'll think more of y'all going forward. So, uh, yeah, no Wednesday activities. Um, Friday, December 3rd is the Living Nativity and Christmas Parade. I still need like 20 people for the Living Nativity. So if you're free on December 3rd, come talk to me. I need your help. It's only like 30 minutes. You put on a cool costume, and you get to participate. Okay? Maybe. <clears throat> all right. We will talk about that after service. Um, I think that's all that I have. I'm, yeah, that's it. So we'll pray, and we'll get back to worship. All right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the ability to come and worship you, God, freely, without reservation, without uh, constriction, without persecution. Um, God, we love you greatly, and we just pray that as we enter the rest of this time of worship, God, that we would see it as just worship in heaven. Uh, God, that there would not be any, any barriers, any boundaries, any, anything stopping us from just opening up and letting your Holy Spirit pour down on this place at this time. God, as we, we hear a message today from Dr. Queen, God, that you would just anoint him. God, that you would let your spirit flow through him, that nothing that he says would be of his own word, God, that would be exactly what you have for him to say for this time and this people at this place. God, we pray all these things in your name. Amen.
Come on, church. Come on. We've been fleeing wide your heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. And open up the doors. Let the music play. Let the streets resound. This is 
<laughs> Hello. All right. Choir. Oh my goodness. Let me stand over here. Choir, you are going to be the choir today, and I'm going to teach you what you're going to sing. This song you get to sing over and over and over. Um, Thanks be to God. That comes easy. But this verse, I just want to go over the chorus, the verse with you one time. They're going to sing it with you. And when it comes time for that, I'm going to turn around and ask you to join singing. The words are, the words are going to be up there today? Okay, good. So here we go. Would you go to, uh, now we come with grateful voices. Thanks be to God. Joined as one. Yeah, there we go. Let's do that. Give us our key. Here we go. I'm going to turn this off. Here we go. Now we come with grateful voices. Thanks be to God. Join as one each heart rejoices. Thanks be to God for this journey. Okay, when it comes to that, I'll turn around and ask you to sing with me.
our kids can be dismissed to Children's Church now. So today I get the, the privilege of uh, introducing a, a, a seminary professor of mine that really and truly I get the, the privilege to call a friend more than a professor. Um, a guy that um, he has devoted his life, as the song said, that till every tribe and tongue voice your praise. That's the passion of his heart. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Queen. He's going to come uh, give us a message this morning. Good morning, First Baptist Church. I bring you greetings from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, just right up in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, from Adam Greenway, our faculty. And we just want to, I've come on their behalf and on our behalf to say thank you. Thank you. You say, thank you for what? I've never even been to that school before. When you give uh, to your offerings, your tithes and your offerings to this church, a portion of what you give goes uh, to the Baptist General Convention of Texas. And then the Baptist General Convention of Texas forwards that on to the Southern Baptist Convention that distributes that to fund a missionary force worldwide of 3,667 people, church planters here in North America, and also funds to the six Southern Baptist seminaries. Your seminary, though, is Southwestern Seminary. And so that our students can go, and it costs them right at the bat, right for any Southern Baptist because of your gifts, they get a 50% tuition discount right off the top. So they can study with all their hearts and all their minds, and it doesn't cost them an arm and a leg. So I want to say thank you. And I also bring you greetings from Lane Prairie Baptist Church, just right up the road here in Joshua, Texas, where I serve as associate pastor of evangelism. And uh, Pastor Ricky Fuchs brings his greetings, as well as our church. We're so thankful to be uh, partner churches with you here in Johnson County. I hope you've got a copy of the Bible, or maybe you've got a tablet or a phone, and someone invites you to open your Bible or turn your tablet or phone on and, and look up Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18, and this morning I want us to look at 11 verses, the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 18. If you're looking at this on a computer or on your, uh, uh, some sort of computer device like a phone or tablet, you'll want to select the English Standard Version, that's what I'll be reading from today if yours is just a little bit different. But Acts chapter 18, and I want to preach a message to you entitled, Conquering the Corinthian Cringes. Conquering the Corinthian Cringes. I don't know about you, but when it comes to evangelism, as an evangelism professor myself, I think there's probably no word that probably brings more fear to a Christian than that word evangelism. In fact, I don't know if you've known I was going to preach or not, but I was kind of surprised uh, to have so many people come today knowing that there was going to be a sermon on evangelism of all things. It's kind of a scary proposition sometimes. And it's because there's a lot of fears that we associate with that. Sometimes we're afraid of failure. Sometimes we're afraid of rejection. Sometimes we're afraid of being by ourselves and doing this on our own. I'll never forget the scariest, most fearful frightful evangelism encounter I personally have ever had. It happened up in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I was with another student. His name was Samuel, and we were going just door-to-door evangelizing. We still do that up at Southway. We do a lot of evangelism, but that's one of the ones that we do. And So we were just knocking on doors, and we came to the, a particular house, and we didn't even get to the door. There was a pickup truck that was right there in the driveway, if you can just view it in your own mind. And there were a bunch of men, grown men, big husky men, who were standing around that pickup truck, and there were two men that were sitting in the bed of that hit pickup truck. We didn't even get to the door. We were doing, uh, uh, you know, cement to uh, truck evangelism, I guess is what we were doing. And so I just went up to the guys and I said, Hi, my name is Matt, and this is Samuel. And we've come from Southwestern Seminary, that school right over there, to tell you about how you can have peace with God through Jesus. And you know the church that as soon as I said those words, peace with God through Jesus, every single one of those men, if you can just see it in your mind's eye, started laughing at me. (laughs) Now, you want to talk about being kind of off your game and, uh, you know, fearful. uh, What am I going to do next? I mean, that was me. Everything you're thinking, if that happened to you, that was what I was thinking. 
And I thought, what will I do? And I need to reassert, control the conversation. And so I sized them up. And this one over here and that one and this one. And, I, and the two guys sitting in the bed of the truck. And, and I sized them up to find the biggest one of them. And the biggest one of them was standing, sitting in the bed of the truck right before me. And I took my finger and I said, is that funny? And all of a sudden when I said, is that funny? I looked down in that guy's lap and there was sitting a gun. Now my fear had gone to exponential levels. And I thought, my goodness, what, what in the world will I do? And I thought, maybe I'll meet force to force. And I did, I did have two guns with me, but neither one of them were loaded. And so that wasn't going to do too much uh, for me. And so I thought, what will I do? And I just said, I'm just going to feign ignorance. And so I said, man, you're not going to shoot me with that thing, are you? And he pulled it up, and I put my hands up, stepped back, you know, and he's holding it up. He's like, man, this is a BB gun. And I said, well, BB that thing behind you. I want to tell you about Jesus. And so he put it behind him, and I was able to tell the whole crowd of them about Jesus. And look, I'm still alive. <laughs> I want you to know that evangelism can be a fearful thing when it comes to evangelism. I have a PhD in evangelism. I teach evangelism for a living all over the country. And I still get afraid of evangelism. Do you know not only does a Ph.D. professor in evangelism get afraid of it, but the greatest missionary evangelist in the entire world, the Apostle Paul, he got afraid when it came to evangelism. There's going to be a, a text that's right up here on the screen. I want you to see this. It's maybe familiar to some of you who've read the Bible f before. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, I was with you when I came to you. I came to you in weakness and in what? Fear, Fear and in what, church? Much trembling. Trembling, another way to say trembling is he got a case of the cringes. He was cringing in fear. Why in the world would a man who Jesus himself spoke with on the road to Damascus a man who had done many miracles. A man who had seen many churches planted. Why would the greatest missionary evangelist in the world say to the Corinthians, When I came to you, I came in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I've just got two points to my sermon this morning and then we're going to go home. The first point that I want to talk to you about is the source of Paul's Corinthian cringes. What caused him to have that much trembling? What caused him to have that fear? What happened when he got to Corinth that caused him to be so afraid? And I want us to look at the source of the Corinthian cringes. And then at the end of our message, I'm going to talk about the solution, the cure for the cringes when it comes to evangelism. And in order for us to see why Paul was afraid, when he came to Corinth, we've got to look at it in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 18. This is when he first came to Acts. So if you would, please follow along with me in the text as I read. The Bible says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied, he was devoted to the word, to the gospel testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was right next door to the synagogue. Crispus. The ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord. Together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, pay attention, do not be, what church? Afraid. He came to Corinth in fear 
and in much trembling. Don't be afraid, Jesus says to Paul, but go on speaking. And don't be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. This is God's word for us today. The Bible says that Paul, in verse 1 of chapter 18, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. We know from his correspondence with the Corinthians that he was afraid, fearful, and he was weak. Why in the world does Paul come to Corinth fearful, weak, and with a case of the cringes in much trembling? Well, we won't have to go through all of it, but let me just reference you. It's here on the screen. If you were to read Acts 13, 14, 16, and 17, you will see exactly why Paul comes to Corinth weak and in fear and in much trembling. It's because in Acts chapter 13, he sits out and he preaches the gospel. He actually preaches the gospel in a place called Antioch in Pisidia. And there when he preaches the gospel, do many people come to faith in Christ? No. Guess what he gets in return? Not many converts. He gets uh, uh, compelled to leave the city. In fact, he's expelled from the city never to come back again. How does that make you feel? Welcome to a new town. The Bible says in Acts chapter 14, he then goes to Iconium. He shut the dust off of his feet. He goes to Iconium. There he preaches the gospel. And the Bible describes a violent attempt against his life for preaching the gospel. They pick up stones to throw at him. And they throw stones at him until he leaves the city. He goes from Iconium to Lystra, and in Lystra, he's there, he preaches the gospel, and they must have been a lot better throw, because when he's in Lystra, they take stones to throw at him, and this time they hit him, and so many rocks hit him, that they think him dead, and they drag his body to the city gate to tell any other Christian, you want to come here and preach that stuff? This is what's going to happen to you. In Acts 15, he kind of heals up. He goes to Jerusalem. There's a council that goes on in Acts chapter 16. He makes his way to Macedonia. He leads a lady, lady right at the river to the Lord. Her name is Lydia. He goes into the city. There's a demon-possessed girl who's, who's flying around and skipping around and saying, There are the servants of the Most High God. And she's demon-possessed. Paul casts the demon out of her. She's whole in her mind. She was a slave girl, so the fact that she no longer had a demon meant that she could no longer tell the future of some of the people in the city. And so they have Paul and Silas arrested. They put them in the jailhouse. And there they begin to praise God, sing praises to God and pray. And this is before Elvis Presley, First Baptist. The jailhouse rocked. (laughs) And when it rocked, the chains off their hands and their feet came off. The doors came open. And the Philippian jailer himself was going to kill himself, but they stopped him. They said, we're all here, don't do that. And he asked the question, what must I do to be saved then? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in all your household. And so he was. In Acts 17, he goes to Athens, and there he's around a bunch of uh, professors, philosopher types. And he's on the Mars Hill, it's called it, Areopagus. And there he preaches Jesus, and these philosophers, the vast majority of them, though some did believe, some said, we'll hear you again on this matter, the vast majority of those philosophers made fun of him. Do you know what, brother and sister? If you'd gone through being expelled having a violent attempt against your life, being stoned almost to death, being imprisoned and whipped and being made fun of, you'd be afraid into the next town you came to tell somebody about Jesus too, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's why he comes in fear and in much trembling. So what I want to see is I want to see what does Paul do? He comes in fear, what does he do, and how does he Make sure to get rid of this case of the trembling and the cringes that he has. Look at the Bible says in verse 2. When he came to Athens, uh, from Athens, he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had just come from Italy to Corinth with his wife Priscilla. You've maybe heard of Aquila and Priscilla, if you know anything about the Bible. These are great missionary workers of Paul. 
And the Bible says he found them because they just recently come there because Claudius, who was the emperor of Rome, had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. Now there's a lot of debate upon why Claudius expelled the Jews from the city of Rome. I think the best explanation comes from a historian by the name of Suetonius who said in the years 50, uh, 41 to 54 BC, uh, AD, there was a group of Jews who would not bow the knee to the emperor, but rather said that they pledged their allegiance to a guy named Crestus. What does Crestus sound like to you? Christ. And so because of this, I believe that's why Claudius commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so all of a sudden, here comes Aquila and Priscilla from Rome, they think that it's because on, on behalf of the emperor, but I believe it was part of God's plan to reunite this couple with this missionary called Paul. And the Bible says he went to stay with them in verse 3. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, let me just explain to you what's going on here. I don't know if you can remember back to your geography days. So maybe you can help me because I don't remember all of mine. <laughs> but I know that a continent is a large piece of land that's surrounded by what, church? Water. Water. Okay, good. All right, we got that. That's a continent. And an island is a small piece of land, let's see if we get you this time, that's surrounded by what? Water. That's right. It's surrounded by water. But then how many of you remember an isthmus? Anybody remember the name isthmus? An isthmus is a land bridge. It is a land strip between, that connects two larger bodies of land. And so it has land on both sides, but on the, either side of it, it's got what? Water. There you go. So an isthmus. Corinth was built on an isthmus, on a land bridge. And how many of y'all have ever heard of the Athens Games, the Olympic Games? Anybody heard? Okay, we got one, two. We got four people, Pastor, that have heard of the Olympic Games. Some of y'all don't watch TV, do you? The Olympic Games. There was also not just the Olympic Games in that time, but there was another athletic competition in that day. That athletic competition was called the Isthmus Games. You know why it was called the Isthmus Games? Because it was held on a what? Isthmus. But not just any isthmus. It was held on the isthmus of what? Corinth. That's right. So when people would come from all over the Roman Empire to see these athletes compete, just like they did in Athens with the Olympic Games, back then there was no Hotel Six. They did not leave the light on for you. There was no Holiday Inn or Hilton or Marriott. There was none of that. So how in the world do you think that great groups of people who had come to see an athletic competition, guess, how, guess what they had to rent or had to buy in order to stay overnight to watch this athletic com competition? Anybody have a guess on that? A tent! This is a very lucrative business. Now, let me just say something. Uh, let me just kind of just forestall something here real quick. Women, when you think of the word tent, I already know what you're thinking. You're thinking of a project your husband does when he goes to Walmart and he gets a pack of plastic with polymer poles. He throws away the directions. He puts something together. He looks at it wrong and what happens to it, ladies? It just falls down. Yeah, I know that's, that's what you think. Men, you think the entire opposite thing. When you think tent, you think plastic polymer pole but you think this is Lego for adults, you know. And you put this thing together, and you think it's the most sturdy thing in the world, but a wind comes by, and what does it do? It blows it over. That's not the kind of tents that Aquila, Priscilla, and Paul were making. These are not the kind of tents. That, they didn't go camping to go and see these athletic games. In fact, in the original language, in the Greek here, the word uh, tent maker is really the word leather worker. In other words, these tents were not made of plastic. They were made of leather, of animal skins. They would hold up against the wind. They'd hold up against the weather. They didn't have flimsy polymer poles to try to hold up the tent. They had big wood logs that these tents were built upon so that they could withstand anything that came against them, a storm or a hurricane or something like that. These were well-built tents. And the Bible says that Paul goes and stays with them 
And he makes tents all throughout the week. So that meant on Monday, he was making a tent. On Tuesday, he was making a tent. On Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, all the way up till dusk, he's making a tent. But Luke tells us something happens at dusk on Friday. That's when the Sabbath begins. The Sabbath does, isn't not just Saturday. It starts at dusk on Friday and goes till dusk on Saturday. Look at what happens at, the, at Friday night. The Bible says, verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every what? Sabbath. That meant on the Sabbath he was not making tents. He was going to the synagogue like any other Jew would. But he wasn't going there just to be taught by the teachers of the law. He was going there, look, to do what? To try to persuade Jews and Greeks. He was dedicated to sharing the gospel, trying to persuade Jewish believers in God and also Gentile God-fearers that Jesus Christ was God and they needed to believe in him. And that's what he's doing on the Sabbath. Then on Sunday he would go back, he would probably worship, and then he'd go back to doing some more tent making, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All the way. That's what he does. That's, his, that's his, uh, his, his process that he goes through. That brings me to the first fear that many of you, as, long as, 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 as uh, well as myself, have when it comes to evangelism. When it comes to evangelism, some of you have not evangelized because of a fear of failure. Fear of failure. Some of you say, I've never been to seminary school like the pastors. I've never been to Bible college like the pastors. I've not got a certificate in evangelism training like other people do. I've never been trained in evangelism. So I don't evangelize because I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Look at what Paul says. Look what Luke says about Paul here. He says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, we went into the Sabbath. He didn't get behind a stand or a pulpit and preach a message in Corinth. He did that in other places. But here, he's not preaching, the Bible doesn't say. The Bible said he is doing what? He's not preaching, he's persuading. And he's doing so through, it says, he reasoned. The Greek word there for reason, I won't say it, but if I were to say that word, you would say, you know what, I've heard a word like that before. It sounds a lot like the word dialogue. Because that's exactly what Paul was doing. He was not up on a stage like I am preaching to you. Paul was in the synagogue having conversations. Back and forth. Dialogues. Reasoning. Trying to persuade one-on-one -on -one people to believe in Jesus Christ. So the good news is, if you're going to share the gospel with somebody, you don't have to preach a sermon to do that. You can do it in your everyday conversations. And you say, okay, well, yeah, I might can, I've had conversations before. I know how to do that. But how do, what do I know to say to people about Jesus? Well, here's the good news I wanted you to know. If you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, then you know enough of the gospel to share it. Can I just repeat that again for you? If you are here today and you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, then you know enough of the gospel to share it. That principle comes from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance. In other words, I told you urgently, he says, what was delivered to me, what someone else told me. Some of you say, I've never had evangelism training before. If you're a Christian, you've had evangelism training. You know what it is? It's when you heard the gospel. When someone delivered to you the gospel and you believed it, that was your evangelism training. In fact, that was the evangelism training of the early church. They didn't have Roman Road. They didn't have evangelism explosion. They didn't have three circles back then. You know what they had? When the gospel was shared with them, that's what they shared with other people. And friends, the good news is, if you know what has saved you, then you know what will save someone else. You already have all the words to say. You're not going to fail. In fact, by the way, let me say something about that. The only failure in evangelism is a failure to evangelize. Success in evangelism is doing it. So if you're afraid of being a failure in evangelism, then you are, you are being a failure if you're not doing it. <laughs> but if you want to be a success, if you're really afraid of the failure of evangelism, you're going to start telling people about Jesus Christ. Let me just give you a word about this. 
I'm up at Lane Prairie Baptist Church. We're in the country. Y'all are in the city. We're in the country. We, we've got a bunch of people who don't have the education level that, that, that people in this church probably have. And they were not doing evangelism uh, like a lot of churches in, the, in, in the Texas are not doing. But our pastor led us to start sharing the gospel. And we celebrate it every week. And do you know what we're celebrating today at our church? The most gospel conversations in one week that we've ever seen. 110 gospel presentations this week. 110. And let me tell you something. These are not by seminary people. These are not by people. I mean, there are some seminarians there, but all those were not done by seminary people. Those were not done by people with major educations. These are people that are done just like you and just like me. And if we can do it at Lane Prairie, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters at First Baptist Cleburne, you can do it too. Now, let me just reverse something for just a second. If you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, you know enough of the gospel to share it. But the inverse is also true. And I, I'm not trying to make anybody doubt anything here, but you at least need to know this information. If right now, right here and now, you don't know enough of the gospel to share it, if you don't know what you would say to someone, if they came just like they did to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? If you don't know enough of the gospel to share it with somebody, you at least have to ask yourself, do I know enough of the gospel to be saved by it in the first place? Maybe you're here today and maybe, honestly, you've been in church all your life. You know about Jesus, but you don't know what the gospel is. Maybe today you would like to come to speak to Pastor Larry or myself or Pastor Aaron or someone else. And just make sure whether or not you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it. Again, we're not making anybody try to doubt their salvation if they've got it. But if you don't know enough of the gospel to share it, at least ask yourself, do I know enough to be saved in the first place? Do I know enough to have believed it in the first place? So that's the first failure of fear, the fear of failure. But look at what the Bible says in verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, that's Philippi, just so you know, Paul was occupied with the word. The Greek there really means he, was, he devoted himself exclusively to the word. Now, whenever uh, Luke and Paul use the word word, they're not talking about the Bible necessarily. Now, again, Paul preached the Bible, okay? So don't think I'm against preaching the Bible. But they used the word as the gospel, as a synonym for the gospel. So when it said that he was occupied with the word, it wasn't that he was just up in some ivory tower reading the Bible every day, okay? He was occupied with telling people the good news. We know that from the context here. Look at what it says. He was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews... That the Christ was Jesus. Now, whatever happened, whenever Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, now he's not tent making anymore. Now he's not just doing this on, Sabbath, on Saturday or on the Sabbath. Now he's doing it exclusively because of something happens when Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia. Well, what, what was it about them coming that allowed Paul, freed up Paul to be able to go and to be able to devote himself to the word. Well, you don't have to turn there. You can write it down and look later on. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, that mentions this. It also is mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia to, be Paul in, to meet Paul in Corinth, they came with a gift from the Philippian church. And it wasn't just a present for a gift card. <laughs> it was money so that Paul didn't have to make a living anymore making tents. Now he could go out and preach the gospel freely without having to work. He was devoted full time in his ministry in Corinth to preaching the word because of the generosity of the Philippian church. And so the Bible says as he goes and he testifies to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus, we come up with the second fear, the second most uh, dominant fear in evangelism. We've already talked about a fear of failure comes up the fear of rejection. Look at what happens in verse number 6. The Bible says, When he testifies to the Jews that the Christ of Jesus, they opposed and reviled him. Let me just say that for just a moment. They opposed and reviled the greatest missionary evangelist in the history of the world. We are sometimes afraid of sharing the gospel because we're afraid that the person may say what? Yes or no? No, we're not afraid if they say yes. We're afraid that they may say no. 
And so we say, I'd rather just not do it because I don't want somebody to say no to God. Can I tell you something? People have already said no to God. <laughs> the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none that are righteous, no, not one. People have already rejected God. If you and I go share the gospel with them, it's not going to make them reject it anymore. It'll actually give them the hope that they can actually stop rejecting God and receive God in faith through Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says here that he was opposed and reviled. Paul had people reject him. Let me tell you something. I shared the gospel yesterday five times. Guess how many times that the gospel, I saw people reject the gospel yesterday? Me. Five times. <laughs> five for five. Was I a failure in evangelism? No. You know why? Because I did it. Yesterday there was a group, there was a lady, a, a twosome. In our church, we did Thanksgiving baskets. And they shared the gospel five times. And guess how many people rejected the gospel in this group of ladies, Rachel and Pam? How many people rejected the gospel? Four. You know what happened to the other one? That person got saved yesterday, gloriously. That person would have never gotten saved because she had already rejected God had she not heard the gospel. And friends, let me tell you something. There's people that you know, that you live with, that you live beside, that you go to work with, that you have relationships with, that right now they're ready to receive the gospel if somebody will only tell it to them. We can overcome this fear of rejection. In fact, Paul was rejected when they opposed and reviled him. What did he do? Did he say, oh man, I'm just going to give up on this. I'm a failure. No, look at what he did. The Bible said he shook out his garments and he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. That's how we know that if someone rejects the gospel, we're not a failure. Because Paul said, your blood is on your heads. My hands are clean. Let me ask you, First Baptist Church, Cleburne. I ask you this because I ask people in my class this. I ask my people in my class this because I ask people at Lane Prairie Baptist Church this. Are you innocent? Or are you guilty of the blood of sinners who are dying and going into hell? I don't know if that's literal, Pastor. I don't know. I don't know if it's literal. I don't know if it's figurative. But in some real sense, Ezekiel talks about this in chapter 3 of his book. In 33 of his book, Paul actually repeats this again in Acts chapter 20 when he's talking to the Ephesian elders. There is some sense of responsibility that we have in sharing the gospel. And if we don't do it, there's some responsibility we bear in people not hearing the gospel. And the only way that you fix that is to start sharing the gospel. You know what that means for me? Today, First Baptist Cleburne. Ma'am, right there, right there. You're, it's so good to see. I love seeing your smiling face today. If, Ma'am, if you go out and you share the gospel today, and someone gets saved, do you know who's responsible for that? God is. God is. If we share the gospel and someone believes it, God's responsible. But sir, right over here, if you share the gospel today at the restaurant that you go to, and someone reject the waiter or waitress rejects it. Who's responsible for that? That person is. Because they've heard, but they've rejected God. But brothers and sisters, I say this at Lane Prairie, and I say this to you because you're one of our sister churches in our county. If no one ever hears the gospel in Cleburne, in Joshua, and in Keene, and all the places surrounding, you know who's responsible? Sir, you're responsible. Young man, you're responsible. Ma'am, right over there, you're responsible. Ma'am, you're responsible. Pastor, you're responsible. Ma'am, you're responsible. Sir, back there in the back, you're responsible. And Matt Queen is responsible. They don't ever hear the gospel. Friends, let me tell you something. Us sharing the gospel, they've already rejected Christ. The only way they will accept Christ is if they hear about Christ. And they'll never hear about Christ if we don't tell them. The Bible goes on to say, he said, look, I'm, I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. Verse 7, he went to the, uh, there and he left to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was right next door to the synagogue. Paul said, I'm done. Y'all are, are responsible for yourselves. But then where does he go? Does he go on the other side of the city? No, he goes right beside the synagogue and still preaches Jesus. And while he's still preaching Jesus, guess what? The leader of the synagogue, the pastor of the synagogue, Crispus, look at what happens to him. Crispus... The ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord. Isn't that good news? He believed in the Lord. He had rejected. What that means to me is this. 
today you're here today, maybe you've heard the gospel, maybe you know about Jesus, but you've rejected turning your life over to Him and letting Him change everything. You've heard it time, you've said no, 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 you've rejected time and time again. But guess what? There's never a wrong time until you die to believe in Jesus. Crispus had one more opportunity. Today, you've got one more opportunity to respond to Jesus, just like he did. And you know what the good news is? It wasn't just Crispus that received Christ. Look at what else the Bible says. And his whole household did too. Now let me say something. I don't mean to offend, but let me just say something. Statistics say that a family that has only a child that gets saved and goes to church, you know what the statistics are? 13%. 13% that if a child is the only Christian in the family, that the whole, there's only a 13% chance that the whole family will get saved. 13%. What about the mom? If there's a family with just the mom that's saved, there's a 23% chance. Statistics tell us 23% chance that the whole family will get saved. Now, those are kind of low statistics. But what if dad is the lone Christian? If dad is the lone Christian, there is a 90% chance that the entire family will get saved. Now, I want to speak to the men here today. I don't mean to offend you, but let me just say this. Some of you men, you're here today. We're thankful you're here. But if you're not living for the Lord and you tell your wife, you tell all your buddies, look, the way I live my life isn't hurting anybody but myself. You argue with those statistics because guess who it's hurting? Your kids and your grandkids behind you. Today may be the day for you, just like Crispus, to get saved so that your family and household may be forgiven of their sins as well. Crispus and his whole household will save. But not just them. Look, the Bible says, and many of the Corinthians heard Paul, and they believed. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're a man. Maybe you're a woman. Maybe you're a child. Today might be the day of your salvation. Because today we won't want you to leave these walls without knowing this message. You're a sinner. You've disobeyed God, and so have I. I have felt Him so many times, and so have you. But God in His love sent Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, not half God, not half man, fully God, fully man. And Jesus in His body on the tree took the penalty for your wrongdoing and my wrongdoing. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty of death for you. He was perfect. He never sinned. He should have lived forever. But he willingly died for everything that you've done against God and everything I've done against God. He was buried and on the third day he was raised from the dead. And today, not just knowing it up here, but today, if you'll change your mind about who you think God is, you can't please God. If you could please God, Jesus would have never died. If you realize you can't please God, only Jesus does, repent. And today, if you'll believe in Jesus alone for your salvation, you can be saved. And just like Crispus, just like his household, and just like the Corinthians right here in the text, today you can believe in Jesus Christ. How do you do that? You can do it right where you are. You can do it after the service. You can come and speak to the pastor right up here in just a moment. Would you make that decision today to believe? There's some of you here today, you've already believed. Thank God for that. But have you been baptized? Look what the Bible says. Hearing Paul, they believed and they were what? Baptized. Maybe you're here today and maybe you're a Christian, but you've not been unwilling to be baptized by immersion. I don't know where your baptistry is. Is it behind there? (laughs) Behind there? Have the screen come up. Have them have to oil that up to pull that up. Maybe you've not been baptized before. Maybe because you were sprinkled or, or something like that as a child and that was a part of your experience. That was a part of your faith experience. But friends, the Bible, nowhere in the Bible will you see anybody ever was baptized first and then believed. They always, that's what makes us Baptist. They believed just like they did here and then they were baptized. Maybe some of you like a 71 year old woman at Lane Prairie Baptist Church when she heard this message she said, you know what? I made a response. I kind of did it because of my friends. I got baptized, but later in life I got saved. And my baptism was on the wrong side of my salvation. And she came up in front of her peers in her church, and she said, you know what, I've been saved. But my baptism, I got baptized as a child in a Baptist church, but it was before I believed, and I want to get the baptism on the right side of my salvation. Maybe today you want to come speak to Pastor Larry about getting your baptism on the right side of your salvation. They believed They were baptized. And then the last thing I want you to see this in verse 11. They belonged. Look at what the Bible says. And Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God not at them. Teaching the word of God not to them. 
Teaching the Word of God, what church? Among them. You know what that meant? He was part of them. He was with them. Maybe you're here today and you've been searching for a church. Maybe you've just been saying, God, do we need to join First Baptist Church? Today, maybe God is saying through His Word, you've believed, you've been baptized, but today you need to unite with this church. Pastor Larry can tell you what the, what the way in which you can join with this and unite with this church is. I don't know what that is, but he can tell you how to do that. But maybe today, God is saying, I'm answering your prayer. You need to come speak to the pastor about uniting with this church so you can belong. You believe you've been baptized. Now you need to belong. Why do you need to do that? Because friends, let me tell you something. If you're here today and you've been coming and you're not a member of this church, this church needs you. Amen, church? This church needs you. But guess what? You need this church. Will you belong? Last thing and then I'm done. We're going to have one more slide here. We've talked about the Source of the Corinthian cringes. Let's look at the solution for it. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. You remember he said, I came to you in fear and much trembling. Jesus knew that. And in fact, his fear was so intense that Jesus had to come one night in a vision and say to Paul, Don't be afraid. You say, well, how do you know he was afraid of sharing the gospel, of evangelizing? Because of what Jesus says next. Look what he says. Don't be afraid, but go on what? Speaking. What's the only thing that we see Paul speaking about in this text? Who's he speaking about? Jesus. In other words, he's saying, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking about me. And he goes on to say, and do not be silent. What is, maybe you're here today, and I don't know what your fear is. Maybe it's not rejection. Maybe it's not failure. Maybe it's something else. God is calling you, to, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, to share the good news with other people. You know, and even people you don't know. And how are you going to do it? Because you're afraid, just like I'm afraid as a professor of evangelism. You can do it, church. I can do it because of what Paul did. Look at what Jesus says. Don't be afraid. And then he gives the reason why he should not be afraid. He gives the reason why you and I should not be afraid to share the gospel. Look at this. Verse 10. For I am what church? With you. I am with you. That's why we don't have to be afraid of finding the words to say. Being rejected. Not knowing what to do. Not knowing what's going to happen. Because Jesus is with us. In fact, he says these very same words in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, and what? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, let me tell you something. The thing that will cure fear, fear of evangelism in our hearts and in my life, and I'm a testimony to it, because I still get afraid every time I share the gospel. Is Jesus Christ. In fact, it's this principle that's up on the screen. Look at this. Boldness in sharing the gospel of Christ comes from trusting in the what church? Presence of Christ. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Don't be afraid. Don't zip your lip. Go on and speak about him. Don't be silent. Why? Because he is with us. And so what does that mean for us today, to church? There are four responses that this text, not this preacher, there's four responses that this text particularly gives us all today. Number one, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Hearing Paul, they believed. I'm not talking about do you know. I'm talking about has Jesus ever transformed your life, radically changed you because of your faith in him. Today, I want to invite you, when we begin to sing this song softly and tenderly, there's a lyric in that that says... Come home, sinner. Come home. I'm a sinner too. And I came home when I was seven years old in 1982. Is today the day you need to come home softly? And if you do, if you feel like, if you got questions about that, would you just step out and speak to Pastor Larry? He, he's up here. He's not, pastors don't just stand up here just to be seen. Do you know that? You know why pastors stand up here? To receive people. Maybe today you need to believe in Jesus Christ. A second truth. There's some of you today that might need to be baptized. I'm not talking about rededicating your life and getting baptized. I'm not talking about washing away your sins. But I'm talking about telling the world that you believe Jesus lived. He died on the cross. He was buried on the third day by resurrection. Power of the Holy Spirit. What happened? He was raised from the dead. Is your baptism on the right side of your salvation? Have you ever believed and then were baptized today? Pastor Larry wants to talk to you about that today. Would you come and speak to him?
There's a third call today that this text gives us. It is to belong. I don't know who you are, but I can't help but believe there's not someone here who's not a member of this church. Maybe you've been coming. Maybe you've been wrestling. Should I join the church? Should I not? God, what do you want me to do? This text tells you what to do today. Today, will you belong and be among this people? Not just come visit them, but be among this people. Pastor Larry can tell you about how to unite with this church. Let's be a great church to unite with. Today, will you come? And then last, probably the vast majority of us, you've already, I would say most of us have believed. Most of us have been baptized. Most of us belong to this church. But do you like Paul? Do you like the evangelism professor that's speaking to you? Do you get afraid when it comes to telling people about Jesus? And maybe you come to speak to your pastor. Maybe you just come to the altar. Maybe you come sit on the front row and say, God, I'm scared to death to do this, but I know I'm supposed to do this. Would you help me trust in your presence so that I can share you with other people? You say, well, I don't usually go up to the altar. Well, make an exception today. God's calling you to respond. You say, well, only bad people come up here to the altar. Are you a bad person, Pastor Larry? <laughs> You're a bad person saved by Jesus. That's right. Pastor Larry's not a bad person, and you're not either. You're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner, just like he's a sinner. But maybe tonight, today, you need to come and make a response to him. So I'm going to ask our musicians to come. I'm going to ask Pastor Larry to come. Any others that need to get into place, I want you to ask you to come. And church, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want no one to look around at this time but the pastor. Even the musicians, when they get their place, they're going to close their eyes. Pastors Aaron, Pastors Larry are going to be up here. And Pastors Aaron... Uh, Larry and Aaron are going to be the ones that are looking at this time. Maybe you're here today and you just say, I need to believe in Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I've got some questions about whether I believe in Jesus or I know I haven't, and I need some prayer about this. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to say you in this seat, you wearing that thing. We're, not going to, we're just going to pray for you. And if you're here today and you would say, you know what? I need to believe in Jesus Christ. I have some questions about that. Pastor Aaron, Pastor Larry, would you just pray for me? Would you just put your hand up real quick for just a moment? And just let us see that. Anybody here like that today? I know I need to believe in Jesus. Thank you. Maybe there's some of you here today that maybe you've never been baptized before. Maybe your baptism's on the wrong side of your salvation. And you say, Pastor Larry, don't call me. Don't come to me. But would you just pray for me today? I know I need to make this decision. Anybody here like that today? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just put your hand up. I need to talk to somebody about baptism. Anybody here like that at all? Thank you. Maybe there's some of you here today that don't belong to a church. And you say, you know what, I want to explore that possibility here at First Baptist. Pastors Larry, Pastor Aaron, would you just pray for me about this? I'll come talk to you at the right time, but I need to, somebody to pray with me about enjoying with this church. Would you just put your hand up? Just put it right back down. Anybody like that today? And then last, and then we're done. And we'll sing. First Baptist Cleburne, is there blood on your hands? If I was to ask you, when was the last time did you tell someone about Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about saying God bless you when somebody sneezes. I'm talking about share with them the way of salvation. Could you tell me when that was? Today, would you just maybe say to your pastors, pastors, pray for me. Help me to trust in the presence of Jesus Christ so that I so that I might tell people about Jesus Christ. Who's here today? And just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to tell people about Jesus. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Who else? I need to trust in the presence of Jesus. Just put your hand up. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Who else? Heavenly Father God, as we sing this song softly and tenderly, we pray your Holy Spirit would work in this place. That people would believe. People would be baptized. People would belong. And Lord, that your people would commit to share the gospel. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.
you brother I know you join with join with me in saying thank you to Dr. Queen this morning for his uh, wonderful message we've had some who've made decisions here today had one Donnie here who is just celebrating his relationship with God. And so we just affirm that with him. Don. I, I sit on my porch over here every night and sing Christian songs. And his lady too. That's what it's all about. It's all about the spirit. It's about the spirit. Thank you, brother. I want to introduce uh, Don McKinney Hammond. Don. She comes by statement from a another church, having been having believed in Jesus, having been baptized by immersion. But she comes by statement from another church, and we'll get that specific information here. If you join me in celebrating that fact, her commitment and our commitment to her and to Donnie, right. would you say Amen? Amen. And our grave. 